Okay, uh, great. And, and thanks uh, uh, for everyone being able to uh, make this on, on pretty short notice. I mean, obviously a lot's going on and we're trying to keep on top of this. Um, I, 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 David and I put out this blog last week uh, and I, I suspect that, that most of you have read it, but um, you, you know, just the, the quick overview is the fact that uh, coming into the, this crisis, we already were at very short supplies, uh, very strong demand, um, stock levels at the lowest level since you know, what we saw in the food price spikes back in 2007, eight for wheat, um, you know, down near what we saw for corn and soybeans back in 2012, 13. And um, on top of that, you're talking about, you know, major producers of wheat and, and uh, feed grains uh, in Ukraine and uh, Russia. Um, I mean, I keep telling people that 30 years ago, when the uh, former Soviet Union broke up, uh, these were net importers, uh, and it's changed, you know, where they've regained their role as, as primary breadbasket for the world. So taking, you know, uh, disrupting production, disrupting trade out of those regions is very, very significant. And I think the other big side of this uh, is the impact on fertilizer markets and energy markets more generally. And I think that that's sort of what we try to address in this blog. So why don't I just turn it over uh, to questions and we can go from there. But my colleagues here, uh, David Laborde and um, uh, I'm sorry, Camille, I'm probably going to, uh, why don't you introduce yourself to so, uh, each of you? Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, my name is Camille Janakranfa. I'm a senior research fellow at uh, the Walton Strategy and Governance Division. Thank you. Great. David? I'm David Laborde from the Market Trading Institution Division. Great. Okay. Take it away. Drew, do you want to? Yeah. Th thank you, Joe, for that introduction. Uh, if you, if anyone wants to raise their hand uh, for any questions on Zoom, if you have trouble, just unmute yourself and, and jump in if you have a question. Thank you. Uh, wow. It's a real privilege to be with so many experts and just get to ask a question straight away. Um, I work for Politico in Brussels. I've been writing a few articles about the, the EU's, uh, you know, first tentative responses to this. Um, firstly, we're hearing that there might be fresh sanctions placed on Belarus by Europe this week. Um, Belarus, um, as far as I know, is a big source of potash, yeah. um, which is used for certain fertilizers. Can you tell me, can anyone yeah, tell me a bit more about this? What could sanctions mean for, for potash? Where else could European farmers get, uh, get access to it? Um, how... How devastating would this be for the Belarus economy? Uh, just anything you can tell me about that, I'd be really interested to know. Yeah, let, let me just start just by saying that Belarus and Russia, you know, combined uh, account for about 15% of uh, world markets for, for fertilizers uh, in terms of trade. Very important in, in areas like Sub-Saharan Africa. David, you, you've been following this. Uh, why don't you jump in? Yes. Um... I think Joe has, has already said the scene, meaning that they are critical supplier of potash, not only for uh, in Europe, but also for Africa, the Middle East, up to India, and even Brazil import a significant share of their potash for, from, from this uh, part of the world. So it's at a global impact. Uh, we have alternative suppliers. Um, actually, Canada is a big, uh, big provider of, of potash. Now, how people can scale their production that's not so easy, you know, mining activities cannot be uh, uh, scaled very quickly. So there is a serious risk that first price have increased and will continue to increase or so cost of production increase. And uh, we can see shortage of, of uh, potash in, in many places, um, so not only in, in Europe. And I mean that the next harvest can really be uh, reduced in, in several places. Maybe just one parenthesis on potash. Belarus was already targeted by sanctions even before this crisis, coming from, you know, in particular, the hijack of the Ryan airplane uh, last year. And uh, therefore, the state company and the parastatal company that are involved in, in the trade of potash should have been disrupted. And even a country like Lithuania was even thinking to basically close their um, infrastructure and basically their railroads 
to uh, to, uh, to to Belarus, meaning that Belarus will not have been able to use the Lithuanian port to export their potash worldwide. So you see, uh, before the crisis, things were starting to to degrade, and now it's it's a very severe shock. Great, thank you, Camel John. Did you want to add anything about uh, the impact on Belarus's economy? If if you not specifically, actually, yeah, David covered everything here. Yeah. Okay, great. Eddie, did you have a follow up? It looks like. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I just went in with quite a specific question straight away, but I mean, the, the broader question here, I mean, from what I've seen so far, and obviously I'm not an expert, I'm just a, I'm just a regular journalist, but you know, there's a lot of talk inside the EU about, oh my God, it's going to push up uh, farmers farmers uh, input prices even higher than what they're currently currently facing. And there's a lot of talk about strengthening internal food security within the EU. Don't you, do you not think that the real question here is, a, uh, is about poorer countries? Um, and it's about whether harvests not in Germany or France will be maybe slightly affected by, by you know, lack, maybe lack of fertilizers or whether animal feed prices will go up for European farmers. It's more about maybe North Africa who are heavily dependent on, on grain from this breadbasket in the world, or maybe sub-Saharan African countries. Can you tell me, you know, do you agree with that? Do you think that's, do you think that's right, the right analysis? And do you, and can you tell me more about what impact this could have on, you know, third countries or the third world, as, as people used to call it, you know, developing countries? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think uh, for uh, large, uh, you know, exporting countries like, like the US or, or the EU member states or Australia or others who are, who are, you know, big players in world markets, uh, they will be hit by input prices, but they're also going to enjoy high uh, output prices. I mean, we are seeing uh, grain prices at record levels and oilseed prices at record levels. Uh, the, the real concern are, are the big net food importing countries in particular. Uh, some countries specifically depended on Ukraine or, or um, uh, uh, and, and Russia, um, but uh, so so one is just the fact that that so many countries depend on on um, that region for wheat and coarse grain and sunflower seed and sunflower seed oil and barley and a whole host of commodities. Um, so that's an immediate effect. They're going to have to find different suppliers. Um, and all that means higher prices. And we've seen that certainly in futures markets. The other thing, though, I think is very important is what the impact on productivity will be. And that's a little harder to try to get a good estimate on. Uh, but in fact, if, if fertilizer prices uh, continue to uh, remain uh, extremely high, if uh, supplies of potash and, and are essentially cut off, uh, then this will have an impact on productivity. And there too, we see poor countries very highly dependent on, on imports of those uh, uh, products. And if I can just follow up on that, I mean, you have well summarized the situation in Europe and obviously in Europe, there is you know, other issues and policy driver that can be used, in particular, I think in the sphere of, of biofuel. But any reduction of the European supply is also going to impact uh, some of this country, meaning that if you are in Algeria or in Egypt, you bring your wheat either from the Black Sea or from France and this region. So if you disrupt directly what's happened in uh, Russia and Ukraine, and if at the same time, basically the French wheat has to go first to a European consumer that have this purchasing power and can pay for it, you start to see more of this scarcity for these importing countries. Now, uh, all the countries in the world have already been hurt, especially not only fiscally, but as an economist, I will look at the fiscal impact by the COVID-19 crisis. So, you know, the capacity to pay for additional uh, safety net for farmers, for consumers has been a bit limited, but Europe can still take care of their farmers and their consumers. Now, if you look at a country like Egypt, where the price of wheat is heavily subsidized today, uh, so the price of food is heavily subsidized, or if you move even farther east up to Bangladesh, where the price of fertilizer is heavily subsidized, the type of price increase we see is putting a heavy burden on the finance of the government. 
for instance, Bangladesh has to already scale up their program uh, of fertilizer subsidy that normally is about $1.3 billion to $4 billion in the, the, this last month. So now it's 4% of their budget that has to spend on that. So you see, there is this effect. And yes, some countries can try to smooth the impact by using um, public policies, but at one point, they will not be able to do it. And that's where the population is going to, to suffer the big blunt of the shock. Yeah, if I can add here, yeah, as Joy and David mentioned, yeah, impact will be everywhere, not only in Europe. Uh, developing countries actually will face uh, more pressure because they are poor. The governments cannot afford to support agriculture or consumers as European countries or US or other Western countries can do. Uh, I think uh, Joy and David mentioned in the press release, uh, in their uh, policy brief, if some uh, major importing countries start uh, introducing export restrictions on uh, wheat or other uh, products that will make even more uh, severe impact in uh, the food importing countries. Dr. Glauber, uh, I can't start my video for some, this is Bill Thompson. I recognize your voice, Bill. Oh, yeah, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> um, I, I got a couple questions. Um, on, on the fertilizer, um, issue you know uh, farmers here in the u.s already are facing very high fertilizer costs and you know this is a, a a global issue what happens there i'm assuming this will add on to the cost of uh the operation costs for farmers here um and the second question i have is even if uh the war invasion were to come to a halt today, um, do, you, do you think that the Ukraine would be able to get a corn crop in this year? Um, or is it such on the ground there that there's no way farmers are gonna be planting for uh, their summer crops? Uh, yeah, let me let me answer the last one first. I think, you know, planting normally occurs in April. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to say how disruptive the invasion has been to date. I mean, we have we have some notion of where those those uh, the the troops are located, uh, but most of the core growing areas right now are still, you know, they they could be planted. And but that is the real concern. I think is if this war extends through the planting season, then that will all be just potentially disrupted, and so you essentially could lose an entire crop. Um, you know, and that's that's a big, particularly given the importance of of that. And and when I'm saying uh, uh, entire crop, I'm talking about the spring planted crop. So really, barley and corn uh, and um, sunflower seed. Wheat, of course, it was planted in the fall. So there, yeah. the question is, can you harvest the wheat for you know in 2022, or is that impeded? Um, these are big questions we don't know, and and probably will at least have a little better idea within a, a month, but hopefully, you know, this, this, uh, the invasion, st you know, stops and tr troops withdraw, and then you, hopefully you'll be able to get in a crop. But I don't think it's, it's necessarily time to write it off yet, but, but it, it's that, that is certainly a big concern, Bill. The other thing is fertilizer prices, and David can speak to this as well, but um, fertilizer prices have had just like a lot of the commodity prices had been going up last year, right? And so, uh, uh, but it's, it's important to understand that, um, you know, there is a little bit of, of divergence in natural gas prices. They've, they too also have followed energy prices up, but they've been up severely in uh, Europe. And so uh, th those nitrogenous fertilizers, you know, that depend on natural gas for a feedstock uh, you know, you've seen the much higher prices, even higher prices in Europe. And David can speak to that much better than I can. Yes, uh, and on this fertilizer, I will just also follow up about the fact that for the next uh, planting season of, of Ukraine, um, the relation with their neighbor, meaning Belarus and Russia, I don't think are going to improve in the next coming uh, month. So when 90% 
of um, the potash right now used in Ukraine come from either Belarus or, or Russia. So you see there is clearly some bottleneck and some logistic to, to figure out in order that even if people can plant, then the, the growing season take place in relatively good condition. Now, uh, yes, the natural gas is directly linked to this nitrogenous uh, fertilizer market because uh, as you know, urea and ammonia are basically mainly processed from natural gas. In China, they use also coal and in other places, but the bulk of it comes from natural gas. And therefore the increase in price of natural gas lead to an increase in price of this type of fertilizer. And broadly speaking, the price of fertilizer today are the same level than what we have seen in 2011-12. So at the beginning of the discussion, Joe was raising some parallel with previous uh, crises, but we are very high. And compared to two years ago, uh, prices have already more than double. Okay, so we, we are talking really about high price of, of fertilizer. Now, in order to produce natural gas, sorry, in order to produce fertilizer, you need natural gas. And these markets are not integrated globally because you need basically pipeline to, to trade what we call the dry natural gas. Uh, there is a small market that is based on the liquefied natural gas. So basically that's where the US can export uh, natural gas to Europe and to some extent help managing the, the shortage that can come from, from Russia. But the current price of natural gas in Europe is, um, I'm not going to say a uh, mistake, but I think already four or five times higher than, uh, because from one week to another, the market is very volatile. But yes, we are talking about four or five times higher in Europe than in the US. And so producing fertilizer in Europe is four, five times more expensive than in the US. That impact European farmers, but also impact African farmers that were traditionally also bringing some of this fertilizer from uh, the Northern Hemisphere. Thanks. Thank you all. Uh, any, any further questions? Sorry, could you just say that last bit again, David? Uh, you said, I just didn't hear what you said about the how it's going to impact African farmers. So I mean that we, we have talked about the fact that yes, Russia and Belarus provide fertilizer for many places in the world, but also parts of the nitrogen fertilizer that Africa used today come from the Northern Hemisphere, from Europe. So when we say Europe is not only the European Union, but also Norway. And so how the natural gas markets right now that are mainly regional markets, okay? That's why we have this big price gap between Europe and the US. The high price of natural gas in uh, Europe leads to a high price of nitrogen fertilizer in Europe, an issue for European farmers, but here also an issue for uh, global farmers. And in particular, the country that were uh, using basically Europe for buying a lot of their farm inputs. And so, and then for Africa. Thank you, David. Uh, so we've got a question in the chat um, uh, and we'll take a few. So I'll read this question in the chat and then we'll uh, go over to Finn and then uh, over to, to Teresa, um, just so we can get as many questions in as possible. So the one in the chat from Conrad, Conrad Hoyos, in which countries would you see social protests first if the conditions get worse? And are there any indications already of social protests? Uh, Finn, if you want to go ahead and uh, unmute, ask your question and then Teresa, you can as well. Great, thanks, Drew. Um, hi, David. Hi, Joe. Um, two questions looking at slightly longer term prospects. Um, one is, you know, one of the things that your blog um, warned about was that uh, the current, uh, the invasion and obviously the subsequent fallout and food security shouldn't lead to sort of like policies that sort of ramp up biofuel production um, because countries are trying to move away from dependency on Russia uh, for, for fuel and, and gas, for example. Are you, I wanted to know if you are already seeing any push or lobbying on this particular front. Um, and number two is that, you know, there are people who are saying that the, the, the current, this, this fallout actually shows the shortcomings of a global food system where a lot of the countries these days, um, you know, agriculture production is mainly oriented at export markets. So countries are now very much dependent on imports and if there's any disruption that has a massive impact um, and that this system needs to change and that there needs to be a lot more um, emphasis on local food webs and production. I wanted to hear your thoughts on that as well. Thanks. 
Thanks, Hi, everyone. Um, I, I had a quick question about the the scale up of finding different suppliers. You know, you mentioned there are, um, you know, a lot of developing countries that are used to getting their imports from the region from Ukraine. And obviously, if that's not possible, they're going to have to find it elsewhere. Um, you know, how long do you expect that to take while well, we have sort of a a time frame where there is a big gap and you know supply is drastically down um is there the possibility that eventually it it can be scaled up or will the price of that um at this point is that looking like it's just going to be too expensive for countries to restore their previous stock numbers thanks thanks Teresa. joe do you want to start off with responses yeah sure and uh I let me just, uh, uh, insofar as the last question is, let me start there. Uh, I think that's already happened, uh, certainly in terms of the North African countries. We have, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that, that in statements out of uh, Egypt and other places that they've said that they've, one, have been stockpiling grain. Uh, uh, I mean, these, it's not like this happened overnight. It did. The invasion itself did happen overnight, but but there was uh, there's been a lot of build up to that, and I think so. People have been seeking alternative sources. I mean, we are talking about for wheat and and feed grains and and oils and other things. You know, global markets. So people do find other suppliers. Um, it just comes at a price. Um, so, you know, the uh, I again, I don't think the certainly the tensions have been known for, for a long time now. Um, um, I, I do think for, it's, it certainly will complicate uh, operations by, uh, you know, organizations like the World Food Program that has to meet humanitarian needs. Uh, they have to purchase grain on, on the open market. They often, for wheat at least, often went to the Black Sea uh, for supplies. Uh, that's all complicated now, and it will, uh, particularly the fact that prices are so much higher, so that's going to require more uh, funds to meet those needs. Um, uh, so that, that at least that one, um, David, you want to, or, or uh, you guys want to jump in on any of the other questions, I, rather than having me answer everything? I, I can take a, a couple of them. Uh... And then I will let uh, Camison follow up. Um, I think there is, on, on the social unrest question, um, I will tend to believe that the usual suspect in, in the yes, North Africa, Near East, uh, and uh, Middle East can be the region where really the food prices uh, are hypersensitive and the population can uh, react and has reacted in the past very strongly on, on this food price inflation. Uh, but also we have seen it in the past in East Africa. Now, what I just want is that we have to be careful in the sense that, you know, political unrest is a combination of different drivers. Uh, we already have, depending where you are in the world, the COVID-19 and the COVID-19 restriction has put some pressure on the population. So, you know, some can really just, you need a spark to, to start the process. Um, but that, I will say, uh, the, the situation. And in some other places, we can see actually farmers uh, in the street uh, because their, uh, yes, their, their cost of operation will be too high. They don't have access to, to fertilizer. Um, and, and we have seen in the past, you know, when farmers are not happy even in India, they, they go to the street. So that's a really a kind of um, local issue. But clearly, uh, we have some uh, hotspot. Uh, and when I talk about Near East, I talk about Lebanon, I talk about Syria, uh, and, and that's important. The second point I want to, to address is this question about what the global food trading system look like and people say see we see that we are too dependent on uh, on export so obviously uh, that's we have to to react strongly to that because you know if today iraq and um and i say syria are looking for wheat on the world market it's because we have first problem at home but also because we have drought at home so a lot of countries in the world every year face local problems and if there is no exporter to provide them grains, uh, their problems will still be there. And with climate change, this, also this type of local shocks are going to continue to expand. So thinking that we can feed the world with uh, 190 countries in autarky is just a nonsense and very dangerous uh, for the, the world we are going to see tomorrow. 
Now, the question of concentration, you know, should we rely only on two or three exporters? It's slightly different. And potentially, you have a lot of countries in the world that today can be can join uh, the world market. You see, for example, we have seen even in Sub-Saharan Africa, a number of countries that can start to be regularly net exporter of corn. So supply regional market, but also world market because they export sometimes to Asia. When you give them access to technology, when you give them access to inputs. So this question about having a fairer a global system where everyone can basically participate to the global production is different that everyone stay uh, at home because everyone staying at home is not a solution. Sometimes you have fluid, sometimes you have incident. So you see that's uh, what I want to say. Now, the question of fertilizer is also a tricky one because here it's not like if with new technology, we can just replace potassium by something else. Actually, potassium is very difficult to replace. It's a fundamental building block of all uh, living beings on Earth. Um, but with technology, we can have a better use of it. We can avoid to waste it. And I think there is a way. So really, the global food system is, yes, we, we need to grow crops and animals for, for human consumption. This requires uh, the building blocks of life. Now we need to bring them from different places. We need a fair system. We need a diversified system. Um, and I will say that's already as what has taken place. I think Joe can talk uh, even more about that. But you know, 30 years ago, there was a shock in Europe or there was a shock in uh, the US. The world was potentially collapsing on world market. Now we have Brazil, we have Argentina, we have two hemispheres, meaning that the harvest decision uh, or the, sorry, the planting decision in in the Latin America countries can compensate problem that occur in the global hemisphere. So all of this has contributed to have a, a safest overall environment, even if some problems still exist. This leads to, I think, the additional question I've seen in, in the chat is um, something even worse than the current uh, so current military event is pretty bad, uh, but we can start also to see food becoming a weapon again in some strategic game, uh, especially uh, if now you think that the Russian influence is Russia, Belarus, Ukraine. Earlier this year, you have seen Russian troops supporting Kazakhstan. So, you know, Kazakhstan is also a big wheat exporter with severe implication for all the Central Asia and East Asia. So now if you start to see a uh, um, uh, consolidation of uh, Russia around some of these commodities and use it for diplomatic purposes. That's clearly not going to bring the world in the right direction where food is here to feed people, in particular people that, you know, we still have seven or 800 million people today before this crisis that struggle every day to, to get enough food. Um, and they can become basically the hostage of, of a new geostrategic game. Yeah, let me just uh, try to address uh, very briefly the biofuel question. I mean, most of you remember back in 2007, 8 and 2010, 11, when we saw the big price spikes, uh, we had this so-called food versus fuel debate uh, because of the rapid increase in, in ethanol production in the U.S. You know, the you still have those issues very much in play. Uh, Europe uh, put some 4 million tons or so of wheat uh, towards ethanol production. Um, and I think even more, probably even more troubling right now is the big ramp up in biodiesel production, both in the US, but other countries like Malaysia and, and Indonesia, where you see uh, big bio or big mandates for biodiesel production. So a lot of palm oil, for example, is now being put into the biofuel market at a time when vegetable prices are extremely high um, and will be exacerbated by the fact that, that uh, Ukraine, which provides 50% or so of the global sunflower seed oil uh, exports, um, are potentially cut off. So these are all, these tensions will come back into play is all I'm trying to say. And I think that, that particularly when you're talking about mandates in the US where they actually cost money, uh, so, for example, for every uh, uh, gallon of, of biodiesel that's produced, there's a, a very large tax credit that has to be paid to make it profitable. Those, I think those are legitimate questions that um, uh, should be asked, uh, whether or not that's what we should be doing at a time when vegetable oil prices are through the roof. 
Thanks. Uh, I just want to give Camel John a, an opportunity to comment yeah. on uh, what this might mean for imports or exports from the region um, or the impact on the region specifically. Thank you, Drew. Uh, yeah. So I would like to address that uh, political unrest or social unrest very could that happen actually. Uh, because of this uh, conflict uh, in Ukraine, Russia-Ukraine conflict, I think our war uh, countries in the neighborhood in Central Asia in the Caucasus will be affected more than anybody else because they are uh, tightly linked with the, both Russia and Ukraine through trade. Food trade is of, of obviously one major channel, but these countries have a more uh, ties with uh, Russia and Ukraine in broader trade. And also these countries also have a link to labor migration remittance. And this will have actually huge impact in uh, uh, more vulnerable countries like uh, uh, in Central Asia, in some countries in the Caucasus. So uh, we have seen already that uh, David mentioned in some uh, social unrest in Kazakhstan earlier this year. Actually, I think uh, I'm not sure about political unrest, but social pressure will be uh, going up again in the region. And then only because of rising food prices and also the declining incomes. Uh, so that's actually very uh, important uh, development. I think uh, uh, today, this morning, uh, U.S. Uh, Secretary of State had a, a meeting with uh, Central Asian Foreign Ministers uh, to discuss uh, these issues. And I think uh, these countries will depend on uh, uh, foreign assistance in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Kimmel John. Uh, just to flag, I think we, I think Joe and David, you sort of answered uh, Jerry's question in the chat a little bit already, but just to, to flag that up in case uh, you have anything further to say on uh, what the uh, the conflict means for the longer term exports from Ukraine and, and Russian influence over over Ukrainian exports specifically. Uh, and, and just to say for everybody else, feel free to throw your hand up at any time if you have a question or want to jump in. Uh, for now, over to you again, Eddie. Thanks. Sorry that I'm just hogging the hogging the questions, but might as well make the most of it. Um, yeah, I've heard also some some MEPs and, and different people representing like the, the French cereals industry um, that I've that I've interviewed over the last over the last week, um, saying that because of because this crisis has shown how dependent um, European like Europe is on on things like fertilizers and and you know and also. Uh, grain from uh, from Ukraine, um, we should be we should we should we should stop focusing so much on the EU's green agenda with its farm to fork strategy, um, and you know we shouldn't be burdening farmers. It's kind of like the classic farm lobby uh, argument, but it feels like it's taking a taking a new shape now in 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 the context of this of this war. Um, so we we can't be burdening farmers with the farm to fork strategy and the and the green deal. Um, you know, when they're already going to be having their margins squeezed by, by even higher input prices. I, I wanted to ask David if he thinks there's any uh, valid validity in that argument or whether it's maybe a bad faith argument, given what's happening in Ukraine. So I will say that half half in the sense that uh, now, obviously, for the farmers, um, they are facing a high cost. So in any case, we may also rethink a bit the type of uh, intensification they are doing. So we can take better rational decision about how we, we use fertilizer and things like that. But what is also sure is that Europe cannot become uh, the garden of Eden where uh, you know you don't think about intensification. Um, if European production go down, if productivity in Europe go down, that's a problem for Europe, but that's also a problem for their neighbor. So Europe has still to contribute to global food security and that's mid to have high productivity. Now, how we achieve it, I mean, that's a key question. And for farmers, it takes time to, to change their practices. Potentially, some aspect of the, the Green Deal can be you know, too much uh, transformation too quickly, or in some case also can lead to a fall in productivity that 
Europe and maybe the world cannot afford now. Now, I think also that that help people to rethink how this question of nutrients is used, you know, how much fertilizer, what type of fertilizer. And, and here you start to see both an environmental discussion about sustainability that can go hand in hand with a more uh, national security discussion, you know. We don't want to waste these nutrients. We don't want to start to dump them uh, at the end with runoff in rivers that contaminate water source that bring to algae on the coast. So how the how we have a, a, a food system and in agricultural production in Europe that is a bit more circular, not just for the sake of of uh, protecting the planet that is already a very important uh, argument, but also to accommodate the fact that wasting resources that are import from partners that are not reliable is a problem, uh, is an opportunity. So you see that I think that the Green Deal and how some of the elements of the Green Deal have to be kept, but also reframed in the current environment are there. Now, clearly a Green Deal that leads to fall in productivity in Europe is clearly not the type of things we want to see today. Thank you, David. Any other questions? If not, uh, I will respect everyone's time and we can go ahead and end the call. As I said before, uh, this was recorded, so we'll be distributing that recording shortly. Uh, also, a quick note for everyone here on the call that uh, next week we're going to have another media briefing on the impact that COVID has had. Uh, two years after the pandemic started on uh, global food security, agricultural production, supply chains and prices, and nutrition and health. So look out for that one as well. I'll be sending that, I think, tomorrow probably. Details will be forthcoming. And also, uh, we've got a series of discussions, uh, public discussions, on global food prices starting next week as well. And we'll be looking at current global commodity price trends, uh, in one event, uh, the next event on the impact on prices at country levels, and then finally one on uh, the increased uh, fertilizer prices and impacts uh, for producers. So a lot more details to come on all of this uh, in the coming weeks. So please look out for more information on that. Any final comments uh, from you, Joe, David, or Camel John, before we sign off? No, other than that, obviously we're available if you need to follow up with other questions or whatever, uh, but. Indeed. No, thanks. Indeed. Thanks, everyone. And I appreciate the fact that some of you are on time zones that are put this uh, conf tell <laughs> this conference at a very early hour. So appreciate it. Indeed. Thank you, Joe. Yes, I'm available. You can uh, hit me up on uh, email or by phone if you have any questions or follow ups. Thank you all. <laughs>